morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm live from Toronto. This is IFA's Global Cafe. My name is Bruna Suez. I am Director of Communications at IFA, and it is my pleasure to host today's session. Uh, please be reminded that this session is being recorded. It's also being live streamed on our Facebook channel. The recording will be available in our website uh, by next week. And now I'll hand it over to Mr. Greg Shaw for a great conversation with the, uh, Professor Shireen Hussain. Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bruna, and welcome everyone. It's good to see people um, once again. These Friday mornings for me are, are one of the highlights of the week, uh, particularly because we get to meet some exciting speakers, hear about uh, the connections with colleagues working in the field from right across the globe. And it's a really an opportunity to share information about emerging trends. Today, we're hearing about the topic of healthy aging and opportunities in the Middle East and African region. Today's speaker is Professor Shireen Hussain, is an established multidisciplinary research leader in population aging, migration, health, and long-term care systems. She is particularly interested in health and care outcomes, equity, unmet need, and long-term care planning. Her background is medical demogra demography, statistics, and computer sciences. Shireen is co-director of the UK Department of Health and Social Care Funded Policy Research Unit and acts as a special advisor to the UK Parliament House of Commons Health and Social Care Committee. Shireen has a uh, global presence and regularly collaborates with prominent international policy stakeholders and formally acting as an expert advisor to various high and middle income country governments in developing long-term care, aging and dementia policies. It's a really interesting day for me. Um, I mean, I've got lots of interest in the Middle East and, and I'm really interested in hearing Shireen's perspective about what's happening in the region across the Middle East and Africa and are the things that we can learn from, are the things that need to be further developed. And it's particularly in the context of these countries have, have a, don't have a high population rate of older people. Um, it's predominantly younger people, but those changes are occurring um, over, which probably will be a short period of time. So I'm really interested in hearing our discussions today. I would encourage people to start putting um, questions in the chat box um, as they think of them. And I will moderate those discussions um, and chats after Shireen has finished her presentation and talk. So Shireen, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our Global Cafe audience this morning. So thank you. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, every, everyone. It's a delight to be invited to speak today. Um, and I'm, I'm really going to cover a um, very small portion of a very big topic. Um, so I'm going to try to cover what is happening in terms of uh, changes, in terms of aging population in the region, with a focus on the area of healthy aging, which, of course, is, is a huge topic. Um, so just to start, um, and thanks, Greg, for pointing out, so the region has been for a very long time, historically been known as a very young uh, region. Um, the, the median age is, is quite young. Uh, the policy is dominated by issues of younger people, uh, youth, unemployment, uh, children, uh, education, children health, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, there are other shifts happening, and it's 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 something to be celebrated that we we now across the whole globe, um, the life expectancy is changing. Not only life expectancy at birth, but life expectancy at older ages as well. So life expectancy at age sixty, for example, uh, has been um, increasing, including in the region. So while you know. Demographers speak about the whole structure of the population and, and they talk about whether populations uh, are already aged or aging or still young um, in relation to very static, um, uh, you know, grouping 
of the of the population according to age and arbitrary points. So we we decided that above sixty uh, is is old or above sixty five, and 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 of course we we have we all have concerns about these cut of points, but from a demographic point of view, we have to find a point to say, oh, how, how the structure is looking. Um, and usually we look at this whole structure and say, perhaps after a certain percentage of this group that we think they are older people. And of course our thinking was guided by um, a framework of static employment. So when are you kind of economically active when you go to retirement? Um, so the, 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 there are very kind of magic figures of 7% of the population is above uh, 65 or 14%. Uh, um, and and we, we judge where these countries are um, in these kind of scales to say the whole population structure is older because there is a kind of a big significant proportion uh, of older people. So. At the moment, the region is still at the early stages of that. There are countries in the region that has already gone beyond this um, starting point, if you want to say, which is the 7%. So countries like Lebanon, Tunisia have already started this. Uh, but other countries are still uh, moving towards this. Um, and of course, this is great that people are, are living longer. But we also have to remember in the back of our minds that not all additional years are healthy years. And again, one can argue about what's the definition of healthy aging, what's the definition of healthy years, uh, but whatever definition you take, whether it's only a medical de definition in terms of the long term conditions or a social definition that includes level of participation and engagement, we do have a quite a differential and gap in the increase in the number of years and increase in healthy age, healthy, healthy years. In the region, I think what I want to highlight some unique features um, because of course, Europe and North America has gone through this process and have moved from a population structure where it is more like a pyramid where you have the bulk of the population at the younger ages into a more like a, a square than a, a diamond in some places like Japan. But this has gone uh, through a, a quite a long period of change. What is really ha fascinating about this process in, in the region, uh, due to uh, traditional high level of fertility rates um, and, and a quick change in, in, in infant mortality, that we're seeing this speed, you know, quite fast. It's almost like a speed, um, you know, kind of a, a speed race. So we think historically, like countries like France and England took between 100 and 150 years to move through these stages of aging into aged populations. And we look at the region and we see countries that are going to do the same process in something like 12 years. And of course, this is too fast, too fast a process, not only in terms of reorienting policies, but also in changing in population minds, in people's individual minds. What do they think about? aging? How do they see themselves uh, as older person? Where is the position of the older person uh, in the society? And to, to, to link this back, uh, I have to give you a bit of background and context and on how the society generally works in, in the region. Obviously, there are uh, differences, but uh, what you can observe is, is, is um, a huge level of solidarity and connectedness and interdependency. Um, I'm thinking about a family unit, thinking about duties and sacrifices uh, and responsibilities. Um, so the relationship between parents and children is a relationship of obligations and duties. So obligations from the children, duties from the parents, they look after uh, their children uh, for quite a long time. So it's common, uh, it's not uncommon for people to remain um, kind of um, dependent on their parents uh, until their early adulthood, maybe to the 30s. But at the same at the same time, uh, there is there is value of older people. So you know, kind of older people are those are the wisdom of the society. Uh, they also have the rights that we respect them. Um, but but this is all great in terms of the narrative and in terms of the intention. But when you think about this process of changing too fast, and instead of having very few people. Uh, kind of in that category, we're having large cohorts entering in this category, then 
the exact application of what does it mean, what does respect mean to older people and opportunities mean to older people becomes very unspecific to the point that it can be counterproductive. So let's think about um, a kind of uh, a situation. Um, um, Older, an older person somehow don't feel that they have an exact position in society. So if you are a young adult, you are trying to get your education, you're going to build a family, you're going to have children, you're going to help um, you know, grow up these children, then you work and then you retire. And then becomes a, a bit of a black hole. So within the society, there is no clear idea of what that person after retirement will look like beyond maybe being a grandparent and looking after your children and, and becoming part of your, um, your, your family. Now, many things are happening at the same time, in addition to the population aging, the whole societal and demographic changes. So the whole um, context of uh, families living near each other or living in, in close proximity, uh, migration, uh, the availability of the other members of the family is all changing. And, and, and people are finding themselves in new context in their um, in in their you know later years of life, um, and then also they they in many cases um, their expectations even from themselves is not shaped very well. Um, in addition, when we think about uh, as the countries as a whole in terms of the structure, the system is not really geared to providing opportunities for older people to participate. So then. A big question becomes um, within this narrative of respect and treasuring and valuing, what is the real applications of these concepts? What is the expectation and perception of an older person? And is it a gender specific? Uh, is it a regional specific? And what are the opportunities for all the people? I talk a lot to many, um, to, to many informal carers or family members and all the people in the region. And almost always the, the, the issue comes from older people is, I am capable of doing a lot of stuff, but my family think that my role has changed. They try to help me too much to the point that I don't find my voice. And I think this is very important because especially when we think about healthy aging and we look at the existing frameworks around what constitutes health, we found that a big role is engagement and participation and feeling valued and feeling having a purpose. And if you take this out, there is a huge impact on the cognition, in the well-being, in the mental um, and psychological well-being of a person. Hence, in addition to the bigger picture of policy, there is a very important agenda to do with the social perception of aging. Um, and I find this to be crucial, particularly at this stage of uh, demographic shifts. So we are entering, these countries are entering into aging. They still have a little window to prepare. Uh, the majority of them will be on the swing of change um, in the next decade. Some countries, as I mentioned, have already started this process, but the majority of the countries will start in the you know, 2030, beginning of the 2030 decade. Um, so as important as we think about the social policy elements of aging and population structure, structures, it's also really important to think about the sociological elements uh, of aging and really capitalize on what is good what is good in terms of concepts and narrative and ideas, uh, but materialize it with, with practical examples. So this is even in the case of people who are, you know, in their, you know, have very good health uh, outcomes, uh, but they have um, finished their employment, they retired. Uh, of course, you have to put this in a context where retirement age is not um, is quite low in the region. Uh, there is differentials between women and men. Uh, and whether many women were actually participating in the formal labor uh, economy or not. Um, but even for those who still have um, ability to provide and ability to contribute to the society, the opportunities and access to opportunities is very limited. Um, and that is not because people don't like older people, 
but it's because governments is so occupied with with the agenda of younger people because this is the, another unique feature of what's happening in the region so the first unique feature is the speed uh, if we think about it uh, compared to europe and north america the other one is the parallel changes with aging along with what we call population dividends or the youth bulk. So you still have a big group of younger people who still have needs to be met by the state in terms of employment opportunities, in terms of educational opportunities, in terms of social protection. This hasn't been seen uh, you know, in Europe. Europe has been going through this much slower uh, change. And now we're facing different set of problems related to the shrinkage of the working age group. So we can see this as positive or negative. So we have capital choose. So we have, you know, this region have, um, you know, the youth resource, the power of change. And at the same time, they're retaining a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience coming from the older cohort that is going to stay. Uh, so it's a matter of how you link the two in terms of policy development, how to think about the needs of the younger population, as well as the needs of the older population. And that's a challenge. Uh, so this is, this is a, a very important point to, to highlight when we think about um, aging in the, in the Middle East and Africa. The other point that I wanted to, to highlight that not everybody, as I said, when they grow older, they grow older healthy. In fact, one of the success that the medical advances is that we can actually live with disease for longer. So the period where people can endure long-term care conditions uh, or, or long-term uh, needs is prolonged. And that's a, that's a very big issue in, uh, in countries where it's not prepared for that sort of services. So the long-term care market is very weak in the region. So although that there is a lot of, you know, development in the healthcare side of things in terms of uh, investment in, in educating doctors and nurses and building hospitals, the whole sector of long-term care, even as an idea, is still very, very weak. So the, the whole system still relies on this family model, that there is a family unit, and there is expectations that someone in the family will be available to provide care for the older person. So there are two issues here. One, that it is not always the case, because as, as this has been happening, there has been other demographic shifts. People have fewer children. A lot of uh, the new generation have migrated either internally or internationally. Uh, so displacement in terms of geography. Um, there is also the, the, the way that people lived together and close together has changed. So the actual ability of the family to provide care uh, is, is not always there. Um, and then there is the point of willingness uh, to provide care and their, um, how they can provide care in the right way. So if we don't know what care means and what are the components of independence and empowerment mean, then uh, there are a lot of questions about what the sort of quality of life for an older person could be. In addition, um, that means there is a huge care burden on the family, who are majority are women, either daughters or daughters-in-law. Um, so one of the big things that I think now um, a lot of countries started to discuss is this the, the promise of developing a long-term care. Uh, so while the countries and policymakers are discussing, when there is a need, something happens. So what is happening now that there is a space where unregulated, unorganized, care provision is emerging. So service, private services are emerging that is not regulated, that are not planned, uh, that there are no standards um, because there is a big need. 
people who need to be cared for, and perhaps their families can afford to buy these services, uh, but there is no um, regulations about it. And obviously there is no trust in these services. And here there are concerns about uh, the type of care people can receive, issues around mistreatment, issues about abuse, etc. But thinking about it from the other side then, and linking back to the youth bulk and the, the high level of un, unemployment, particularly among women, perhaps this is an opportunity. So this is an opportunity, an economic opportunity to develop a strong market that is shaped on the correct principles. So taking the romantic and, and abstract idea of treasuring, but translating it to actual uh, process and actual principles that actually harness the issues of dignity, of person-centeredness, and of independence, and then develop a strong market that can be supported by the state. So then that will create uh, labor uh, economy opportunities and will create um, a, a potential solution for some, not all, of course, because of the cost and because of poverty rate. But at the same time, one should think about, and, and countries and states and organizations should think about the, the, the actual resources that older people can bring. So if you think about very large cohorts coming into old age, um, we can prepare people, we can create opportunities for engagement, for involvement in the wider society. So of course, the role of grandparenting is important and uh, older people will still provide financially and emotionally and socially to their, um, to their younger children, but they also have the right to have the thing that they like to do um, available for them. So the idea of interdependency, but ensuring that people have choices need to be introduced and need to be enhanced and given fertile grounds to be developed. So to sum up in the, in, in the remaining uh, three minutes, um, what I want to say that there is a, a huge sea of change happening in the region and it's happening quite fast. And it's happening within conditions that we haven't seen previously. There is no uh, blue um, book, there is no blueprint to go back to it and say, oh, this country has done this because it hasn't happened before. We haven't been in a situation when we have uh, youth bulk uh, pressures on the society um, and also um, increasing and large courts. We have to think about countries, for example, like Egypt, which is over 100 million, and think about the, the, the size of the cohorts that are entering uh, old age. So while this, is, um, this creates some pressures, they also create opportunities, opportunities for labor market participation among the older people who are capable to do this and opportunity to create new markets to support this group, to support them not only in long-term care, but to support them in engaging and in providing new activities, new volunteering activities, um, new entrepreneurial ideas. But one of the most important things that the, the, the region has to come to grapple with is perception. So it's really important to think about how we perceive older people, but also how older people perceive themselves. Like, you know, people, older people can be ages to themselves. They will prevent themselves from taking an opportunity, even when it's, uh, it's there. They will see themselves as, I finished my big role, and now I shouldn't have any, um, any desires. I shouldn't have something that I really want to do. Um, and again, this mentality of obligation and, and sacrifices. And I think there is a huge role here for everybody to play in terms of communicating um, and, and kind of making a better understanding uh, of aging and the meaning of aging. And I'm also a very big advocate of working with younger age cohort going up to older age, so working with even younger children to think about the life course. It's not like you're preparing here at, you at the school just to go and work and then retire. And then what happens after? You know, what does the life course looks like? We are all expected to live longer and hopefully in the next few years live almost all this time in healthy aging because that's that's what we want to all to achieve to have healthy lives, to have meaningful lives um, with dignity. Uh, so I would say 
we need to think in parallel between practical issues, between policy issues, but also within the individual space and the family space, um, both the family and the, the older person um, need to kind of challenge their ideas about what it means to be an older person. Where is my role? Where is my place? And then there will be a lot of advocacy work to create that place within the society, but we need to have a starting point. Um, and I hope that with capitalizing with the with, with the core principles of um, treasuring and valuing older people, we can then translate and bridge this narrative into practical um, applications within, within the society. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Shireen, for that. It was uh, a great presentation and discussion, and I hope that we can generate lots of questions and answers uh, and comments um, from those uh, today. You talked very much about the obligations that families have. And I was thinking about um, immigration and migration trends. And we know that for there's a high unemployment rate of younger people in uh, particularly some of the Middle East countries. There is a propensity for those family members quite often to be looking at what opportunities there might be outside of those countries. So therefore there, there is a reduced capacity that the traditional obligations of family may have. And so in many of these countries, we have a immigration practice of bringing in care workers to actually support elderly in their home. And it could be from the Philippines or wherever. Um, and at some stage, those people um, end up having to, to leave the country. Um, but uh, you're talking about unregulated, um, services. So are there countries that are looking at how to regulate this informal care where families are buying in care services to for family members? Thank you, Greg. It's a very important question. So of course, the context, the region is actually a region of uh, migration flows within it. So there is, of course, some countries that attract, particularly the Gulf region, attract um, uh, workers from the other parts of, from North Africa, for example. Um, and, and it happens within uh, lack of citizenship routes. There is no trajectory to citizenship in that particular immigration. And then um, people after retirement go back to their countries. Of course, there is, um, you know, external from the region migration, like uh, to Europe and North America. There are two things, very important things you, you mentioned here, uh, Greg. The first one is the role of rem remittances in into the pay maybe less um, um, countries with with middle to low income in the region. And the issue of high income countries where they buy actually services in general from other regions like the Philippines, particularly around domestic care, domestic work, and then it becomes domestic care. So what is happening now, and, and, I, and I highlighted that, not I just mentioned that very quickly, that in countries like Egypt, there then uh, there is a capital. So there is remittances, people need care, and there is a capital available to purchase care, but there is a gap in the market. Right, so then people will tend to uh, have a, a domestic worker with their live-in or someone who comes every day and provide a little bit of care uh, around that. Now there are some companies seeing these opportunities and offering um, in general to quite a high price per month, someone to come to look after that person. Um, in some countries, there is very initial steps by government to try to recognize that. So in Egypt, there has been an initiative that is started, I think a couple of years ago, by offering training opportunities for unemployed young people to train as long-term care uh, workers. Uh, and then working with uh, uh, an NGO, a charitable organization, to place these workers uh, with older people. Now, this was a very modest initiative. I think they managed to train 50 person and only half of them remained. Um, so, so there was some recognition, but there is no high level at this stage um, kind of overview of the whole market. So yes, there is some recognition, recognition that this has to be, something has to be done about that. Uh, but there is no system of regulating that. There is no standards of kind of thinking about this. 
Uh, some countries in neighboring uh, regions, like in Turkey, so Turkey obviously is a um, half, you know, European uh, Asian country, but there is a lot of similarities with the region. Uh, there is some standardization that has been uh, introduced for workers who are employed by the government. So, and that is mainly in residential care, uh, etc. But definitely, I think from conversations with different governments. Um, so we had uh, good conversations recently with the Saudi government. There is realization that actually uh, we need to look onto, into this issue because there are it, it's fertile ground for exploitation from both ends. So whether it's a migrant workers placed in a family and then their work extends from being domestic to also include care and whether that migrant worker might be exploited, but also what about the, the older person who is left with that with that worker who don't know uh, the basics and principles of, of care. So there is some recognition. I think we're still at the early stage. Um, I hope that answers the question. I, I see some more hands. So I would prefer to take also more questions. Yeah, okay. So, so um, Shmuel, thank you for your question. And it really comes um, around the, the pandemic, COVID-19. You know, has there been opportunities in the region because of COVID-19 uh, around improvements in healthy aging among poor, particularly poor and low social economic groups um, in the Middle East and Africa? So any thoughts? Yeah. And well, unfortunately, I'll go the other way around. The COVID has been horrendous for all the people in the region. Yeah. Um, because um, with the curfews and shielding and fear and lack of vaccination, um, what families did to protect their elderly is to ask them not to go out and to remain at home. And we, so um, obviously there are no statistics, there are some uh, qualitative research and anecdotes that in fact that has led to worsening conditions and quality of life. So obviously at certain age, um, deconditioning is a real issue. So if you don't go out for a couple of days, you, you, you know, if you don't use your muscles, you might lose them. Uh, and also, co you know, cognitive kind of, um, you know, being alert, uh, having your routine, uh, doing what you used to do every day, um, and feeling of fearing, because once you stay at home for three months when it was at one point that this you know or more you fear going out so older people started to feel that they are fearful um and the response to uh, common calls or, or or usual minor health conditions has been much worse um i didn't see or observe that the conversation around covid featured older people so there has been a lot of conversations around COVID in, in the region, uh, and they are always linked to uh, economic productivity um, and, and issues of younger people. Older people were missing from the debate. Similarly, when we talk about displacement and refugees issues, older people are usually missing from that debate, um, which is... Um, which is a grave concern because, in fact, in 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 places of conflict, older people usually remain in place and they have to to suffer that there is no infrastructure. We see very good examples emerging from from these places. So we've done a piece of work with Syria. Um, so emerging that. Um, the communities coming together, peer support, all the people who are more capable can support others. Uh, but unfortunately, they are missing from a lot of debates. And I didn't see COVID featuring as a good opportunity for, for all the people in the region. Thank you very much, Shireen. Um, can I call on, uh, there's a comment in here from uh, Garonda. Um, if you can unmute your microphone and um, ask your question particularly around um, opportunities for developing care services? Yes, uh, my question uh, to professor is that how can we utilize this opportunity to train younger generation for caregiving services? One thing, family caregivers are reluctant because they are not getting payment for their services, even if they work 24 hours a day. So can IFA or institutions and organization help out with a training program 
Th thank you very much, Garonda. I think this is a crucial point, and I think it's it's a very important point to start developing um, this space. Um, so training younger people. So you're absolutely right. Uh, there is a capacity here. So it's not like Europe is is actually struggling with the capacity issues, the supply issue. There is no workers. Nobody's getting these jobs because there is no supply. We have supply. You know, the region has a lot of supply. But there is also a huge misunderstanding of what does this mean? Uh, and is it, there a stigma around it? What is the sort of training? So there is need to be some work done with the media, with the public, and also with training organization to provide something that is sensible and to be endorsed by some form of a quality assurance system. I am aware that um, some big organizations um, that you know, aims to develop capacity. So whether it's through dementia care, so for example, um, you know, uh, Alzheimer's Society International or Health Age and others like the INIA, they try to build capacity and provide training program that is tailored to uh, low and middle income countries, including uh, the Middle East. I think there has to be support from the state. So you have to work with NGOs, but there has to be an endorsement by the state, a recognition that these issues are really important we like we encourage um, and I, I would like to parallel this perhaps when we think about maternal care and then the shift that we recognize the informal um, you know kind of diets or the the health the the birth attendants who are not really qualified health professionals but recognizing their role in the community and then providing them training and how that have have shown in many countries as a very important policy uh, in kind of employing the community uh, capital. Uh, so, so if we get an endorsement from high level, we start from big uh, international organization, whether it's the WHO or the UN, to recognize this as, and, and this is happening actually, so there is a lot of documents and um, recognition that long-term care markets are opportunities, then we need some backing and some facilities um, and some subsidiary to, to get people encouraged to go, and even supporting them in the, in the first stage of finding employment, because the public, uh, don't have the trust. So there has been uh, a recent uh, poll in, in, in Egypt where they asked it in formal care, they say, would you rely on uh, someone who are paid? And they were like, uh, we need someone who are paid, but we don't trust them because we don't know whether they are well uh, educated or they're going to look after uh, my mom with respect. So there is a bit of trust bridging as well. Uh, so definitely, I think everybody has to come together, but there has to be a top down also kind of emphasis that this is really important. So it is materialized. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Shireen. Uh, thank uh, you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Philippa Moha has uh, posed a question and, and it really is around um, practical experiences in African countries. So, um, Philippa, are you there? Would you like to come forward and perhaps you could explain where you are, from who, uh, and what the issues you see are? Philippa? Hello. Um, thank you so much, Greg. I'm from Nigeria. But we have a care issue. We have the, our people are getting older and um, they're being kept away. The older people are being kept away, you know, just in the background, maybe occasional grandparents. But however, as Prof said, the the, the the migration is so much and that you've muted yourself Philippa. hello hello yeah you're on the personal experience from prof of african region any country in the african region that has really gotten into these um, opportunities like seeing long-term care as an opportunity and investing in it so that we can take it as a seed pilot project for us to say yes this country in Africa is doing this. That's what I want from Prof. Thank you. Thank you, Philippa. I will give you an example. So I am completely aware of the situation and I've been doing some work with Zimbabwe and um, actually working with Zimbabwean care workers in the UK who left Zimbabwe to work in care work and then they left care gaps at home. Uh, but I also will draw on another project in Kenya where we were trying to develop some dementia strategies. So I think there are some activities happening, not at the national level. Um, 
but there are some recognition. So Help Age International, particularly in the in Kenya, have been doing uh, a lot of uh, awareness raising. So dementia, particularly, there is a huge stigma with dementia uh, in Africa. Uh, there, there is the kind of lack of understanding of what the disease mean and um, linked to perhaps, uh, you know, witchcraft and, um, and other sorts of uh, perhaps um, unhelpful uh, uh, narrative. Um, and as you say, in many places, uh, Philippa, not only in Africa, I saw this even in other countries, um, that people are put in the background to the point that we... And, and, and the narrative of love comes here. It's like, we love them, so we're gonna keep them at home, but we don't know what to do with them. So we're gonna keep them in the room uh, and then we're not gonna allow them to, to leave and um, you know becomes very unhealthy relationship and frustration between this informal caregiver and the older person. Uh, all what I can say that there is a little bit of work going in, in Africa. Obviously Africa is one of the youngest um, you know, regions in the world, um, and they are going into population aging a bit slower because generally the life expectancy is not as high, but also other trends. Uh, but I know that there has been some activities. Um, I would uh, recommend that you look at Health Age International, particularly in Kenya, um, and look around um, some of the work that they've done with policymakers um, around recognizing dementia um, and, and providing some training to both informal carers and, and thinking about formal carers as well, but it's primarily for families and informal carers. I hope that is helpful. I would, you know, I would love to keep in touch if that would be any help. Thank, Thank you, you so Chris. much. Um, I might also uh, point out that it might be useful for you to be making contact with Emin Amakaro, who's the Director General of the uh, Nigeria's National Senior, Center, Senior Citizens Centre. I think uh, Emin was appointed in that position um, only 12 months, 18 months ago. So, and I know she's worked in the field of ageing for a long time and she's very aware of some of the issues and what's happening around the region. So she would be a useful contact for you in that particular area. Um, Moisa Bianca has talked, has made some comments in or links in um, the chat box, particularly around the issue of I, ITUs or uh, in terms of digital, the digital world. And I'm curious as to um, and then she's put some links into what, what's available and what's possible. I'm wondering what has been the picker around uh, digital communications and technology. Um, and it's such a vast difference between the Middle East and Africa, but your views around yeah. use of ITCs? ICs? Yeah, well, I think, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Muyusa and, and Greg. I think there is um, huge opportunities with um, AT and with uh, social media and the use of technology. Uh, I see this particularly in relation to informal care. So, so the region actually is one of the highest with um, uh, like smartphones. So the, 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 the pickup of smartphone is, is really high and there has been a lot of increase in the use of it. Uh, but if you look at the, the kind of uh, groups that use it primarily um, young people, and of course, it has been a force of social change. So we've seen some changes in the region that were initi initiated through uh, forums and social media. So one, one importance of this uh, is so that I can see I can see AT has has different functions. One of them is um, uh, is self care, of course, and and one of them is information sharing and communication. Um, and there has been some initiatives to look at um, if there are informal carers, how can you provide them uh, with knowledge, with adequate knowledge around certain um, conditions at old age uh, activities. Uh, how can people can uh, organize themselves? and communicate their needs um, and of course you have to sit that with with the idea of misinformation and and how people can pick up on the right information and 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 dismiss the wrong information um, and how can you provide people with the right tools to be able to do that when it's a whole new uh, area so are you sure that you're up, you're able to pick up the right source of advice that has been shared 
So that's an important thing. Uh, and the other thing is digital literacy. So I'm aware um, that, for example, in Saudi Arabia, there has been some, and in Oman, there has been some initiatives uh, to use, and, and particularly during COVID that they have tried to do some uh, health visits, you know, health, uh, you know, visits with healthcare professionals through uh, tablets, um, and then the digital literacy becomes a big issue for among all the people. So they started to put together some classes, uh, particularly for those on lower income, uh, to enhance the digital literacy. So I think an, an important element with this is empowerment. So when I talk about, for example, self-care, you have to empower people to be able to take steps to care for oneself, to value that the remaining life that you have is important and is valuable and you have to look after it rather than think about this is okay, this is the end of it. There is a big cliff. I, I don't know what's going to happen. So it doesn't matter uh, what I will do for myself. And, and you empower them and then you provide them with the specific tools. Um, and, and, and these tools have to be simple in terms of how to use them and why you're using them. Uh, and the link here is really the younger generations. So, and we can borrow things happening from Europe. So in Italy, there is all these um, intergenerational clubs that older people go and younger people from school, they don't have necessarily to belong to the same family. But what, what happens here is exchange, social exchange. So the, the older generation look after them when they're doing their homework, then the younger help them in their IT problems with their phones, with their tablets, and tell them about apps and what to do. And it has been wonderful, uh, wonderfully successful, and it's been implemented in different regions. So there is a lot of cross-learning to happen here. Um, and IT, I see, um, is not um, is not always with its downfalls, but it's a great opportunity if it's harnessed well. Uh, the main concern would be misinformation. And there is a lot of work around that, um, particularly when it comes to health. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, a couple of people have had um, raised hands and I just want to remind people um, what the preference is to put things into the chat box. But I know Catherine, you had your hand raised a little bit earlier, so please come forward. Thank you. Two quick questions or really more comments, one around regulation, one around advocacy that's been brought up. And I remember, Greg, how you talked about how important it was in Australia to have regulations around caregiving support affect equally the quality in private as well as public facilities. So I wanted to remind people of, I thought, that very important comment. And then very briefly, just around advocacy, I have been involved with advocating on behalf of us older persons internationally and it makes a huge difference right now we're preparing to um, attend in october world congress of united cities and local authorities and in preparation there were four policy papers and one was on caring systems and together with our partners in disability we totally changed their perception which initially was the prevailing misunderstanding that we are beneficiaries of somebody else's determination of care to rights holders with our own independence and advocacy. So I just want to again remind, I don't need to remind any of you, you're all advocates, but one person or to collectively with other one persons can make a huge difference. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, Catherine. This is a very important point. And I think it's really important that people from the region themselves, all the people to speak about their needs. And I think uh, um, an important step to empower them and to reach out for them. And I think um, 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 I founded um, a network uh, a few years ago called uh, the Minara Network, which is the Middle East and North Africa Research and Health Aging. And the first thing we started with is to get people on camera older people themselves to speak about their experience. What do they feel that they need to happen? What are their aspirations? What, what would make them happy? And to get that in, in, in like a video and put it on the platform. Um, and I know that the WHO and Health Age, um, particularly WHO, they have these voices um, kind of forum is to bring the voices of older people themselves from different walks um, to give the story life. Because we're not talking about uh, subjects here. We're talking about individuals who have desires and they have their own will and they have their choices. Um, and also 
perhaps in some region we need to empower them to make the, these statements, to tell them that you have the right, you have the permission to speak about yourself, uh, not only about your family or not only about your role within the family. What are your own aspirations? What do you want to do um, in this phase? And, and this is really important because this a lot of this group, when they were growing older, when they're like in their early childhood, life expectancy was around 60. Now they are, when they age 60, the remaining life expectancy is 20. So they have another 20 years to live that they haven't really thought about when they were growing older. They were thinking, oh, life ends there. You know, this is, this is, man, this is the speed of change. This is why it is so important that people haven't really developed this process. Um, so absolutely, you know, advocacy from people themselves and from their informal carers is, is, is so powerful um, and can lead to change. So yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Catherine. Thank you, uh, Shereen. Um, I know Lona, uh, Lona Raji had her hand up, but she's also posed a, a question and comments in the chat function. Lona, do you want to come forward and make your comments and questions? Sure. Thank you um, so much, Professor. I'm actually doing my PhD at Northwest University in South Africa on how can we leverage the capabilities of unemployed youth um, as trained and paid caregivers to provide long-term care for older persons. So what you've been saying has been really talking to me. One of the comments slash criticisms I do get is because this would most likely target unemployed female youth just because of the nature of care, that it is regendering care. Um, I do not personally see it that way. I think it is just an, we have a great need for em, employment in Africa. We're a young continent and um, there we, you cannot address the two separately, or at least that's what I believe. But I'd just like to hear your comments and thoughts about this idea of the strategy potentially regendering care and how we prevent that. And again, thank just you. thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, Lona, very much. And I'm so pleased you're doing this PhD. This is the sort of thing that we need, evidence and knowledge that we can speak, uh, you can use to speak to policymakers. I think we cannot separate care from gender work um, across the globe. And I think this is one of the one of the key concerns even in, in, in developed uh, nations and already aged uh, populations like in Europe and, and the States, that care, even if it's paid, so even if it's formal and paid, it still remains in the mind of the society and policymakers as something that is women's work. Women's work that they would do because they like doing uh, and they will continue doing even if it's um, you know very poorly paid or the working conditions are difficult. I think starting in, in countries like Africa and the Middle East, there is a great opportunity to rethink this agenda uh, and try to see how we can uh, think about gender differently and, and, and what are the, um, the opportunities there that lies for all, for men, for women as, as a form of employment. And also thinking about the different types of needs that people might have, and, and you've got older people older men, older women, you've got people, um, you know, with, with disabilities who have gone into um, adulthood that might need care. And also think about it more professionally. So when we think about the job, rather than it is, um, it's an inherently women's job and they do it without training and they just know how to do it, but think about it as a profession and putting setting standards and, um, and kind of education training that is required. Uh, then we will be able to engage with the gender issue. Uh, one of the things that I liked about the initiatives that I saw in Egypt, that it's actually the, the 50 people that they have trained were almost half and half women and men, which was really interesting. And again, the attrition rate was not very gender diverse. So it's a small, small numbers, but actually men were attracted as well, equally in low numbers, but um, this is a good start. 
Um, um, and, I, and I think this is a process because it's, it's have been long engraved, but I, I would look at it as similarly to what happens with childcare. So childcare now is very acceptable that men can enter childcare care. They can be a uh, nursery nurse um, or can be um, a children nurse. Um, and, and, but this process has taken a long time, but we separated a bit that it's not like women need to go back to work. Um, and I think also we can make the same argument for long term care. We are draining the society from a group of women who are there in mid 40s, in the mid 50s, who are in the peak of their economic uh, productivity. They can't continue working in employment because they have to care for their parents. So we need to think about that as an opportunity for formal training, for attracting um, unemployed young people, whether men or women, uh, yeah. but it's it, it's a process. It's not going to happen over the time because how it has been developed across the globe, really, in, in the thinking about what cares entail. Thank you, Shireen. Um, and when you were talking about the videos that you did of older people, it reminds me of a project which Bruna has responsibility for, um, and I think you will need to be talking to uh, Shireen Br uh, Bruna around we are doing what's called a vanishing project it's about the stories of older people and Bruna is is developing that and will be running that so I'm sure you and her will have lots to talk about I know we're getting very close um, to the time and I want to uh, give you the opportunity to make some closing remarks and there was quite a few questions that we didn't get a chance to talk about and I know Francis, uh, you were asking about your, the views that Shireen has on government reporting on the fourth review of the implementation of uh, MIPA. Um, and Bill uh, Smith, you were asking, um, how is the region being impacted by technology in the care of older people? So perhaps when you're summing up, you might respond very briefly to those two questions. But I would also like to um, point out that I want to invite you all to next week's Global Cafe. Um, and Bruno, if we can get that up on the screen. So next week, we have one of the IFA directors, Mr. Aok Christian, who is, lives in Japan with his beautiful family, but originally from Cameroon. And Aok will be talking about human-centered environment, reflected in the with youth group art project so it's really about how art can impact the whole concept of care and support for the elderly so please join us next week for the global cafe and i know it's uh, competing with another event at the same time um, which was mentioned around idop but we will still be going forward so numbers might be slightly different uh, but that will be fine. So I really want to thank you, uh, Shireen, for the presentation today, the questions from the audience, but some closing thoughts or comments from you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm not going to take long. I think the closing comment that it's for me, it's an exciting phase. It's really good to celebrate longevity. It's a huge opportunity that um, a huge number of people are entering into um, a very exciting phase of life uh, because you have less, uh, you know, kind of um, responsibility. You need to think about um, yourself a little bit more. Um, but I mean, there is a lot of work to be done. So I'm, I'm glad somebody brought up MIPA. Uh, it's again, it's the 20th anniversary of, of, the, of MIPA and it's a big deal. And, and countries in the region have been responding. And I think it's a reminder to this is a very important topic. Uh, they, the, the UN Decade of Healthy Aging is also a very good reminder and space for us all to work uh, towards achieving better quality of life for older people across the world. Um, and I thank people for coming today and for allowing me this platform. And I hope to really to continue the conversation. There is so much to talk about, uh, but I hope that today I've, I've given you some, uh, just a glimpse of what's happening um, in the region in terms of aging. Uh, and thanks again. Shireen, I, I really do want to thank you. It was a great presentation. And I know there'll be lots of uh, people reaching out to want to make contact with you. I know Bruna will want to follow up, particularly around the Vanishing Project. Sure. And um, I thank you all. I look forward to seeing you all next week. 
and please join with me in thanking Shireen. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.